Does anybody want to hear a joke? Dear Aunt Karen, how are you? I am fine. I am writing from camp. We can't go outside because it is storming. Me and my tent mates are in the last tent in our unit. My tent mates are Denise Milner and Lori Farmer. My room is in shades of purple. Love, Michelle. Dear Mom and Dad and Misty and Joe and Chad and Kathy, we're just getting ready to go to bed. It's 7.45. We're at the beginning of a storm and having a lot of fun. I've met two new friends, Michelle Gousset and Denise Milner. I'm sharing a tent with them. It started raining on the way back from dinner. We're sleeping on cots. I couldn't wait to write. We're all writing letters now because there's hardly anything else to do. With love, Lori. Dear Mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. The first day it rained. I have three new friends named Glenda, Lori, and Michelle. Michelle and Lori are my roommates. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Cassie and everybody. Your loving child, Denise Milner. If you don't know about the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders, I did a story over a year ago where I actually went to the location with my buddy Mobile Instinct over in uh, Locust Grove, which is where we're currently at right now. The camp is about five miles from uh, where we're walking right now. So on June 12th, 1977, Camp Scott was hosting about, I want to say, 140 some odd Girl Scouts for a, a week of camping or what have you. And three of those girls that were at Camp Scott was eight-year-old Lori Lee Farmer, nine-year-old Michelle Gouzet, and 10-year-old Doris Denise Milner. June 12th, 1977, that night was very, very stormy. It was pouring like crazy and i can imagine that all of the people all of the girls at that camp that night were not having the greatest of time you fast forward to 6 a.m june 13th 1977 one of the counselors gets up around 6 a.m and is going about their day when they made a horrifying discovery Stuffed in the sleeping bag were two of the girls. They were dead. And there was another girl about maybe 20, 30 yards away. All the girls have been brutally raped and murdered. The only evidence that the deputies can see at the time was on top of the girls' bodies, like the sleeping bag, was a red plastic flashlight with a smudge on it. They couldn't get a good thumbprint on it. And the detectives found a size nine and a half shoe print on the ground, supposedly from the suspected killer. Now, they did have a suspect. His name was Gene Leroy Hart. And uh, this man was on the run from the law, uh, he was wanted on a couple of rapes that he had committed, and he was on the run for quite some time. He was being uh, hid by some of his scumbag family members. Some of these scumbags that live right in this area right now, as a matter of fact, they could live right in one of these houses right around where I'm at right now. So eventually, because the, the, the uh, excuse me, deputies suspected him of committing these murders, DNA was in its extreme infancy at the time, but the people that are in charge were in charge, the deputies, they were 
1,000% sure that this man had committed this atrocious crime. So he was eventually arrested and caught about a year or so later, and he was put on trial for these girls' murders. And the jury found Gene Leroy Hart not guilty for some unknown reason. I guess they decided that uh, maybe possibly he was not, um, you know, maybe that they didn't meet the burden of proof of his guilt. But he was not free, however, because he was tried and convicted of the two rapes uh, that he was originally wanted for. And he was sentenced to over 300 years in prison. And uh, after he worked out on, uh, I believe it was March 4th, 1979, at the age of 35, he keeled over and died of a heart attack, leaving the family members of the three girls and a lot of detectives and people all over the world wondering if he was the one that actually committed the crime or not. Now, as DNA has reached um, advancements that people back in those days could have never even imagined possible, there's been multiple DNA tests. And as best as I can explain it to you without trying to make it seem like I'm some kind of a doctor or a scientist or that I exactly know what I'm talking about, I'll basically just tell you like this. Uh, the DNA test, even though they, you know, they point towards his guilt, and I believe he's guilty, they don't uh, conclusively state whether he committed these murders or not. But people, by popular belief, court of public opinion, whatever you want to call it, they believe that he is in fact guilty of this crime, and I believe it myself. And he went to his grave, not paying the price for killing those little girls. And sadly, their murders are basically still technically unsolved, even though deputies, police, uh, anybody who's, you know, researched the story believes that this uh, demon, this uh, spawn of Satan committed this crime. And this is the scumbag's grave. Rapist and murderer. And what's so disgusting, not so disgusting, but what is partly disgusting about this crime is that his family helped him hide from the law uh, for a long time. And they had the nerve to get this guy a, a grave. And it's sad that in this cemetery, all these people sadly have to be buried in the same cemetery as this monster. I have some choice words that I'm not gonna say I'm gonna keep to myself, but these words I don't say on this channel, but you guys, you guys know what I'm feeling right now. A 
It says online that Michelle's ashes were interred with her mother and fathers. And this is where those are. Can you imagine 40 plus years you have to live with knowing that your daughter was brutally murdered? I can only imagine how many times Richard thought of uh, finding that piece of filth and giving him a, a taste of his own medicine. Rest in peace to Richard, Georgianne, and Michelle. All right, guys. I'm out of here. I'll catch up with you later. Peace out.